let me read something about spectrum analyzers while I'm getting ready. A 10 gigahertz spectrum analyzer can be very expensive or very old or both or big and heavy. Of course, you may luck into something that's wonderful, and I hope you do. I have, found, I have fond memories of my years with an 8551, a Polarad SA84W, just kidding, <laughs> uh, various Cistron Donner products, uh, several AILs, Tech 494, and Ritsu and others. One could get one of those because of nostalgia or limited funds or spend a bundle on a nice nearly new one. And I can't really say much against any of those. Um, the one thing you don't want to do, a couple of things, is don't wait 30 years. Get one because it's the good deal is may happen, may not happen. And don't one that buy one that almost works. You know, you just need the cable in the back, or something like that, or or just glitches uh, with a dead spot at, at 3.5 gigahertz. You're asking for trouble. Buy a good one and keep it a long time. Yes. Some of the stuff I'm going to show you will be at the flea market tonight, and some of it will be for sale. So uh, K6JEY, Doug, he comes from Long Beach. He's been licensed since uh, 1957. He's active on EME on uh, 144, 432, and 1296. And uh, he's been working uh, and almost done with 10 gigahertz small dish EME rig. And uh, he's been an ARRL technical advisor and calibration and test equipment and wrote the 26th chapter of the ARRL handbook. Uh, and he's awarded the uh, uh, ED uh, in 2005 and has been a teacher and a professor for 50 years. Thank you. 50 years. Oh, good. So I'm standing up in a classroom uh, with my Britney Spears microphone, <laughs> or, or anyway. Uh, today I'd like to talk about um, KU band LNBs, and it's nice to be back. Last time I did a presentation was by Skype, and it was nice, but I didn't get a chance to see your smiling faces or get a chance to really talk to you, and it's been a lot of fun to do that. Previously, the LNBs were uh, a 1990s vintage, and uh, they were okay as preamplifiers, but they had a problem with the uh, DROs in them and that, and that they weren't locked and, and almost nobody used them as front ends. Well these days, these days, click click he said, click, okay. The forward and back arrows don't seem to do the trick. Okay, um, these days they come with with uh, PLLs and uh, uh, this talk is going to be to describe uh, 10 gigahertz LMB receiving setups, 10 gigahertz front ends for low frequency spectrum analyzers, and 24 and 47 gigahertz front ends for spectrum analyzers. What can you do? Well, W6S Ed, my old friend Ryan uh, Schmidt, uh, was able to copy the DL0 SHF beacon with an 18 inch dish uh, and an LMB. Uh, he had to work at it, but he got it. You can listen to local stations and you can extend the range of your lower frequency spectrum analyzers. So we're gonna talk about what are called universal LNBs and they all have a phase lock loop in them. They cover 10.368 gigahertz with an IF of 618, give or take. And uh, they're the easiest LNBs to use. You need 12 volts, 200 milliamps, a bias T and um, some kind of receiver. Uh, I, I went through a lot of them. I have a large pile at home of LNBs, and the one I like the most is the Amico L104. It's about 15 bucks on eBay, easy to work on, and uh, quite similar to almost every other LNB out there. Here's the schematic of a typical LNB, and the vertical uh, probe in the waveguide is selected by default. Uh, you do have to do something else, like raise the voltage, in order to get horizontal. So this side is dead, it's biased off, goes into a second stage uh, preamp, and may or may not have a filter in it. But you probably don't want to have one with a filter in it. And then it goes into the gold mine. This is a, a single uh, IC chip that has a crystal correct connected directly to it, and then uh, has a mixer, preamp, all that stuff, and goes straight out with no filtering. It's really nice. 
uh, except the fact that this is an uncompensated crystal and tends to uh, wander around a lot. Now this does not work. Guys. I'll, I'll just, I'll just uh, mark the slides. This is what the inside looks like. This is the vertical side here, horizontal side. They go in through separate inputs to the second stage preamp and goes out to the integrated circuits. These are RF chokes, they're not tuned elements. And this, as far as I can tell, is not a tuned element. Goes into the little chip and, um, let's see, and then goes out without hardly any dist distribution. And then there's an RF choke that goes out to the regulator. Regulator gives you six volts on this pin. And the crystal goes out of these two pins and goes to the crystal and through a zero ohm resistor. That's important for later. Uh, let's see, oops. Do, 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 do. So you might wanna modify this thing for stability. As, as they stand, they drift about 500 hertz, hertz per minute per minute after a 15 minute warm up. Uh, and the resetability is bad because you, you start it up again and it um, uh, starts up on a different frequency and begins to drift. If you put a TCXO modification, the drift goes down to 50 hertz per minute after five minutes of warm up. And the free resetability is excellent. Turn on, comes right back to the same frequency. And, and the whole process is pretty cheap. Uh, I prefer the Raycons uh, because I can see them. <laughs> And there's a, they were saying at uh, uh, Down East Microwave, they have some 0.25 part per billion TCXOs he uses in one thing. You can get these little guys that are fantastic. And they're not very expensive, but, but look at the size of the pencil. <laughs> okay, or you can go with uh, uh, Leo Bodner's uh, Gift to Ham Radio. And I, I, sent it, I, I started this talk about a year ago. And somewhere in January, I found out about these, and I sent out a, a notice on the email reflector, and I think they, you guys bought out the stock on both SDR kits and Leo Bodner. But I found some little tricks to it. If you take the, the GPS uh, module and you put it on a phone battery, like an external battery for a cell phone, and start it up with a computer, set it to whatever frequency you want, and let it uh, listen to the GPS and integrate for a while, like a half an hour, and then you take off the GPS antenna, it goes into holdover mode and it sits in your hand and the only power supply is the cell phone battery. Okay? Parts per billion in your hand walking around plugged into your stuff. Uh, you can leave it connected, that's fine, but that's, I found that out. Uh, parts per billion accuracy, holdover, uh, and, and, and the nice thing is you can take the, the, fa the factor between crystal and input uh, for the LNVs, dial up 27.515 megahertz, and you have an IF of 432 megahertz for the LNB. So you get vastly improved stability, and you get an IF that you can use on a common receiver. For the, the this thing is about 100 bucks, and, and, and you can't buy a crystal for a brick for 100 bucks anymore, and, and you all know what a misery that is. Okay, here's the inside. See, I never leave the screws off of anything. Uh, you've got a, a Blox Max 80 chip. It receives all of the GPS systems and it, it displays 24 channels. So when the, thing's, when the thing gets cooking, you have all 24 channels lit up. It has a backup battery and it has the TCXO on a temperature isolated stock. Leo is a genius. This is not the only thing I've seen him. There's a VNA that he's designed. And this is just a really cool piece of gear, I think. And the coolest thing is the phase noise. At one kilohertz, it's more than a minus 140 dB. So you could multiply this thing up to warm rocks and, and uh, still get good phase noise. Okay, so let's dig into it and modify the L104. Uh, the first thing is that you've got uh, that separate to realize which one is a vertical, which one's a horizontal input. And then uh, I, I know you're saying, why are you using number 12 wire to do this? It's the smallest wire I could find, and it's number 26. It's just magnified. So you pick off, you take the crystal out, and you know, any instructions that say the first thing you should do is cut off the main cable. 
you know, you want to really think about that because you don't want to have to solder it back again. Well, the first instruction here is pry out the crystal. There's no going back. But it's only 15 bucks in case you have to go back. So you pick off the crystal uh, input, you pick off six volts, and you um, uh, pick off a ground any place, and you file a hole in the, uh, in the case. And, and then I, I put RTV in the hole to passivate these because this broke off twice. Now, without the magnifier, this looked like a really good solder job. And, and under the magnifier, it's looking worse and worse because I bought a magnifier, one of these uh, cool, Cooltron, cool, Coolertron microscopes. And uh, my soldering really improved because I could see what I was doing. How many guys have lit up microscopes like this? Okay, the rest of you should buy one. It's, it just it helps you out. Okay, this is my Anritsu spectrum analyzer, low frequency equals to four gigahertz, with a, a, a marker and then a delta marker. And you can see the delta marker is 50 hertz, and that's after five minutes of warm up and one minute of measuring. So it, it went 50 hertz in one minute. It's very, very consistent at that. Notice on the spectrum analyzer, and I'm not selling one of these because I'm keeping it, the frequency resolution is in millihertz because uh, you put a GPS antenna on the input and it not only shows you the position and the time, but it goes in and calibrates the oscillator every time you hook it up. So really with this analyzer, you don't have to ever calibrate it. It does it automatically and it does it after each sweep. Okay, so if you use a 27.515 crystal on the GPS source, the IF output is 432, and that works really good. This does not work at two meters, it's too low. Sensitivity falls out the window, and it does not work at 23 centimeters. It, it may work at 900 megahertz, but I don't have a radio on that frequency, and, and FM isn't a real good choice. So 432 seems like the best choice for an IF for it. Okay, other types of LNBs. Here's a 1320 LNB. And uh, they're okay except the crystal, it looks like this, they're 20 bucks on eBay. The crystal's uncompensated. And you could stick a compensated TCXO in there and that would be a good idea. It's a good, it's a good um, LNB, uh, has single polarization and WR75 input and they're cheap. Um, it also works with the RF Explorer, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, here's a Norsat, you'll see those on eBay. Uh, this is an HS1057, you can buy uh, a Norsat and have ad and have wasted your money, unless it's a C mo uh, uh, a C model. That's the lowest frequency. It's not going to be anywhere near in range for what you want to use it for. The seven means seven tenths of a dB noise figure, and five is five kC drift. They make them in 200 kC models. You'll never find the signal. So, but the five means that you turn it on. It's on frequency. And it's, it just that doesn't drift. WR75 connector. That's a little bit low on sensitivity compared to the other ones, but there's the inside. This is a nice piece of gear. Uh, they're very expensive new. They're even fairly expensive used. I happen to get one for used from Israel for a song. Bypass the filter and the sensitivity goes up, but the thing is so pretty, I didn't want to mess with it and it works fine. Okay, so instead of modifying your Amico LNB, you can buy the whole thing from OK2ZAW, OK his name is Jan. He sells the modified LNB and a bias board. I have one down there. Um, I'll show you tonight at the flea market. And, and the, he's an F connector input and a, a lamp, an incandescent lamp that's the fuse, and, uh, and then a, an LED for on, and an SMA output. And the thing with the LNBs is they're all type F connectors and they're biased. You've got 12 volts coming through the pin, and the center pin sticks out past the, the ferrule on the outside, you're gonna short it out. So whatever you use for a bias T, buy yourself a pile of 10th of a micro Henry chokes and, and put them someplace that you'll remember, and then take one of the chokes and tape it to the lid of the bias T. That way you don't have to look for it, because you'll be cussing around, you know, and you left them somewhere, you know, I mean, I'm the kind of guy, I clean my garage. What a mistake. I put stuff in new places, and I don't know where those new places are, because it's always been over there, right? And now it's over here, and I have no idea. It's like a, went up. it was easier when I was younger. Okay, so OK2ZAW makes, makes them, they're 55 bucks. Uh, there's also another guy on eBay that uses a different LNB and also sells them. I think this is better. 
Um, I emailed him and, and he made one to my specifications because it was easy for him to do. Okay, so as I said, the, 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 the bare stock LNB 104s and the 1320s drift pretty, pretty good, but the modified ones are quite stable. Okay, then I got thinking about one of the problems I saw in, in what people had published was that everybody couldn't get away from the waveguide input. In fact, one guy took the covers off and put up two of them together and somehow came out with a WR90 on the other end with a lot of hacksawing and, and gluing and stuff. There's an easier way. You hacksaw, you take the vertical input, you punch the, the little probe through the board and it falls inside the waveguide. And you make a little hole in the waveguide and shake it out. And then you attach some WR080, or the, the UT080 there and solder it down to the board and run it out. And, and that way you have an external input. Um, and it begins to look like that. Now, the, the way I hooked it up, there's no coupling capacitor between the board and the coax. So you've got the gate bias out on the end of the, the coax, but with a waveguide to coax transition, it isn't important. And just looking at my signal generator, uh, you can see I get a nice clean signal. So I call this uh, Joshua tree engineering or, or maybe totem pole engineering because you stand it on the, on the horn. There it is with one of uh, Kent's uh, antennas, but I had to use an external uh, bias, no, uh, blocking uh, capacitor uh, on the way in to keep it from shorting out. It looks funny, but it works obviously really nicely. Let's see. Applications, well, let's look at some of those. To do uh, local monitoring of the beacons in LA, I use a, an, a Linko DJX11, and it's one of a whole bunch of DC to Warm Rocks handheld receivers. And, and there's lots of discussion on EHAM about which one's better and all that kind of stuff. This one's pretty new and not a lot of, a lot of people have used them. It works equally as well on sideband at 1296 as it does on any other frequency. They are really, really good receivers. They're far more accurate than anything I've plugged into them. And they're, they run on battery for forever. They're, they're fairly new, but they're about 275 bucks. You can get an unblocked one and they're 450 bucks, but I don't think you're gonna be interested in that. Here's a picture in the field. I've got the, a battery in my pocket. I've got the LNB in, in one part of my hand and the re receiver in the other, and I can listen to the local beacons uh, and whatever. That's a good arrangement. You can also use a, a, a dongle, an SDR dongle, 25 bucks, or you can get an SDR kits. If you're gonna go SDR, I would say get an SDR uh, number two, the RSP2, or an SDR IQ. Um, and then I got a picture of Graham GHAJ and his setup. It's really very simple. It's a LNB, bias T, and a Pro Plus dongle, and the program for it, and he says he gets all the stuff he can possibly get from inside the house. It works out easily and cheaply. Okay, so one of the, the crusades I've, I've always been on is, is how can I get a higher frequencies in my spectrum analyzer and, and do it reasonably in terms of cost? But well, one idea is to get a, uh, like a Rigol uh, 818 analyzer that goes to 1500 megahertz, got great back end stuff, great big display and all that kind of stuff, and take the IF output of your old Hewlett Packard spectrum analyzer and plug it in. And, and use that as a narrow band an analysis that you want for whatever signal you're looking at. So that's what kind of this, the rest of this talk is about, is how to use it as a spectrum analyzer front end. So I took the Norsat LNB that I had, that I showed earlier, and hooked it up on this little panel with a variable attenuator. And um, in terms of actually using it, I put in two attenuators. Here's the, here's the one of Kent's antennas into a variable attenuator, a fixed attenuator, in a WR75 adapter, and then around underneath here is the bias T and another attenuator. The attenuators made the input and output the same. 30 dBm in, in is 30 dBm output. So I wouldn't overload the NORSAT and I wouldn't overload the spectrum analyzer. And if I want more attenuation, I've got a graph on the front, I want to crank in 10 or 20 or 30 more dB attenuation, that happens. This is a very nice, small, front end for a uh, low frequency spectrum analyzer that'll give me 10 gigahertz and is stable, resettable, and has great sensitivity. And here it is in action with the, with the larger end rates. 
these Enritsus are available, they're a current model for Enritsu. It's a, a MS2712E, a current model. They're available surplus from Korea and they're about 1500 bucks. I ordered one, I got it three days later. It was wrapped incredibly and it worked perfectly. And apparently that's a report from, from Korea about all of these. I don't know, they didn't use them long enough to even make a scratch on them. Came with a thing and a good battery and all that stuff. But you can see the size of the screen, the frequency resolution. It's, you can, it's a touch screen, so you can hit any one of these measurements and it'll call up the menu and away you go. Very handy to use and very good. And nice back end, a USB output. Uh, and and Ritsu has um, external programs you can run into the serial port or USB port and do further da data analysis. Find it. So for, for 1500 bucks for nearly new current analyzer, and the 100 bucks I've got into this, I've got myself a 10 gigahertz spectrum analyzer I'm not going to have to replace anytime soon. So I decided to go one step further. I have an RF Explorer spectrum analyzer, one of the little guys, and uh, its main liability is that the, the maximum selectivity is two and a half kilohertz. You can't go any lower than that. And so your, your uh, scan width is about 120 kilohertz. That's as narrow as you can get. If, you, if you, they allowed you to get narrower, things would fall apart and look terrible. They try and keep it in calibration doing it that way. And uh, you can see that they give you a frequency readout and amplitude of the strongest signal. And you can set all of that, the scan width and, and uh, averaging and all of that stuff on the keypad here. So, so in terms of using it on 10 gigahertz, you get the most important stuff. You get frequency and amplitude. And if you're adjusting something, you can see the amplitude change. So, so on, a, on an extremely practical level, this is a $150 spectrum analyzer, or $250, depending on which one you get, and a $100 add-on, and there you've got yourself a nice 10 gigahertz spectrum analyzer that's battery-operated and handheld. Take a look at what battery-operated handheld spectrum analyzers that cover 10 gigahertz go for. Close to 5,000 bucks and up. And it comes with a back-end program. You, you plug the cable into the USB port in the back, it charges the spectrum analyzer, and you get um, a laptop program analysis for it. So it's, it's more than it seems. And here it is on my 8563, which is overkill, but I, I put it on an analog scope so you can see what it looks like. And it's very stable, very clean. And here's um, Kent's uh, other Enritsu. This is an MT8212B. They're only about 500 to 800 bucks with a VNA, cable fault analyzer, and uh, spectrum analyzer, zero to, zero to three gigahertz, I think, and a battery. Uh, these are probably the, one of the best deals. There's another one that's a little cheaper, it's a HP, but it's big and heavy, and this one's only about this big. Um, that's, that's probably, if you're gonna get a spectrum analyzer, that would be the one to get, because it also includes a VNA for this frequency range. Okay, so why not the RF Explorer and one of the LNBs? Well, there's, there's the 1320 LNB, which has some accuracy problems, but it's less than the drift of this one. This one has a 2.5 kC window. This drifts less than 2.5 kC, so you'll never notice it. So you've got the $20 LNB, you've got a bias T for 15 bucks, and you've got the RF Explorer for, in this case, this is a $150 model, 24 gigahertz, uh, 10 gigahertz spectrum analyzer. Okay, how about for the higher bands? Okay, here's the, the uh, HP external mixer, 11970K mixer, with the RF Explorer signal generator set on four gigahertz, eight milliwatts, and there's my 24 gigahertz signal from the signal generator over here. It works at 24 gigahertz. A handheld, battery operated, 24 gigahertz signal generator, a uh, spectrum analyzer. Or with RF explorers, generator and spectrum analyzer. That combination is about 500 bucks, including the, the um, mixer. Handheld battery operated 24 gigahertz spectrum analyzer. Or you could complain about it, but it's only 500 bucks. And it's, it's new technology and you get the back end programs from RF Explorer. Why not 47? 
So I took the 8673B signal generator, ran it through a SpaceX uh, doubler, very clean, uh, no second harmonic and no trash in it, into the 11970Q mixer, um, and then used the, what I did is I took the HP signal spectrum analyzer and saw what it put out, and it put out 4.71, no, 4.7310 mega, gigahertz. So I put the, the RF Explorer on 4.7 uh, gigahertz and put the spectrum analyzer on 500 megahertz, and that's what I got out of it. No, 310 megahertz, because that's the IF of the, of the HP. So I was able to do 47 gigahertz with reasonable sensitivity. That's with the same stuff on Enritsu. This is RF Explorer. This is on, on a saved image. And um, there's 47 gigahertz. So I was, was thinking about that, and I thought, well, some of you guys are going to be really, it's okay, but the 11970 Qs are expensive, about 500 bucks, and yada, yada, yada. There's an answer. Kerry Banky, N6, uh, IZW, some years ago made up a mixer out of hobby brass and a Qualcomm diode. And the article is in the reference page in, in my, uh, in my you know, the hard copy in there. It's just a Qualcomm diode, I, IF and LO, um, not much drive, and you can see on both, see this is on 6 gigahertz, a 24 gigahertz signal from the spectrum analyzer, and there's the Enrits uh, output. For, and it'll work, I would say if I was to use it on 24 gigahertz, I would change the size of the tubing to maybe a half inch to look more like WR42, but as is it goes from 24 to 79 gigahertz for five bucks. Yeah. So Kerry's got the article is still available. I have the URL uh, in the reference. In the so you're you're looking at some pretty high frequency spectrum analyzers with good results for not a lot of money. And then I have uh, where did I put this thing? Do, 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 do. I thought I had it up here. Somebody stole it. Okay, when, this is the latest Chinese analyzer. This sort of replaces the RF Explorer because it's the same frequency range. 10 megahertz to 2.7 gigahertz, but it's got a large display. The display is about this big. It's sitting here someplace. Oh well. Probably. Yeah. That's what it looks like. About twice as big as the RF Explorer. Um, and and that's, that's the local FM station uh, with an external antenna. So you can see the resolution is really good as long as you're at a span of 1.3 megahertz, um, and it's, it's at the, that span it selects the selectivity. They're 320 bucks. There's no back-end program with it. Uh, they may develop one later, but it gives you marker of the center, and where the marker is gives you amplitude and frequency. So I thought that, that was really an exceptional uh, uh, improvement in spectrum analyzers. Uh, would you look uh, in my bag there and pull out the RF Explorer? Uh, 10 megahertz. It really goes out quite a ways. It's just the, the, the narrow band is, is uh, small because of the selectivity. But they, they've got, I think, I think actually the yeah, biggest selectivity is 10 megahertz. <laughs> okay, so here's... Here's RF Explorer and here's the Chinese one. And they do about the same thing. They're both battery operated, I think it's five uh, amp hours, something like that. The, yeah, it just depends on how big you want it to be. But that's the two sizes. You can come up and look at them if you want. And I'll have them at the, at the flea market tonight. Okay, so extras. So I saw this, I saw this uh, eBay uh, bias tea and I thought, well, okay, 15 bucks. What could it possibly have in it? Holy cow, <laughs> what, for 15 bucks? And then I, I thought, ah, there's the culprit. There's a tenth of a microhenry choke. That's what's going to, because I blew three or four of them out. You know, I was working late at night. And, uh, so I, I don't have a picture of it. No. So that's when I got the RF chokes and taped one to the lid. And uh, the first one that went out, I looked through my junk box. I didn't have any real small tenth of a microhenry chokes not realizing, of course, I could wind some around a very small resistor. So I had this great big quarter watt resistor sticking up like that, and it seemed to still show some isolation. 
Here's, a, here's a dish antenna that's uh, a sleeper that's on eBay. It's a tabletop. So if you're, if you're kind of fooling around and measuring stuff, I found it to be pretty handy. It's not the cheapest, but it works well, and it does have 27 dB gain. So there's the, uh, it's in your hard copy, but there's uh, Carrie Benke's mixer um, instructions, and then my talk on mixer evaluation, so you can see what, how the mixers compare between Tectronics and Hewlett Packard and uh, uh, the homemade one. Okay, that is it for the presentation, but I'll take questions. Anybody's got something? No. no. <laughs> I'm out of time, actually. Okay, I'm done. <laughs>